Hello dear friends. I hope you're all doing well. Previously, I made a video about extracting gold using the electrolysis method. Some of you asked whether using graphite as both the anode and cathode could still result in gold deposition. So today, we're going to test that and find out together. This rock that you see in my hand contains small amounts of gold, silver, and copper. I'll show you an approximate percentage of each element on the screen. I've already ground a portion of this rock down to 200 mesh powder. The finer you grind the rock, the more surface area it provides for reactions with acid or cyanide. This blue solution is the chloride extract obtained from this rock. This blue chloride solution contains gold, silver, and copper. To prepare it, simply dissolve the powdered rock in aqua regia and place it in a warm environment, like under direct sunlight. The heat helps the metals dissolve more effectively. After that, you'll need to remove the nitric acid. This can be done using either sulfuric acid or urea. Urea is commonly used because it's cheap and widely available. I'll share more information as we continue in the video. Now, to get the graphite rod, I need to open up a used RR battery. Graphite rods can usually be found in most standard RR batteries, so there's no need to spend any extra money. This graphite rod serves as the positive electrode in the battery. Now that the battery is open, let me explain what we're looking at. The metallic casing you see is made of zinc, which acts as the anode. And this black powdery material around the graphite is carbon mixed with manganese dioxide and either ammonium chloride or zinc chloride. This mixture stores and transfers electrons during the battery's operation. To safely remove the graphite rod from the battery, you need to be careful and gentle. If you hit or force it, the graphite can easily break, so take your time and be patient. Next in the video, we'll take a look at how graphite reacts with acid. Will it dissolve? What do you think? Dear friends, I'll gradually be removing some of the older, low-quality videos from the channel and replacing them with new ones. In these upcoming videos, I'll do my best to share more practical and valuable information with you. So if you don't have easy access to a graphite rod or zinc sheet, you can simply take them out of old, used batteries. Make sure to clean the graphite rods thoroughly to remove any impurities. In a previous video, I used copper and iron plates as electrodes. I've placed the link to that video above, so feel free to check it out if you're interested. Now I'm pouring some of the solution into a smaller beaker so I can place the graphite rods inside. If you have access to larger graphite rods, feel free to use a bigger beaker. You can use a DC power supply like this one, or even a regular battery will work. I've chosen a voltage of 5 volts for this experiment. In this setup, I'll be using graphite rods as both the anode and the cathode. The power supply I'm using here is transformer based, which tends to generate a lot of heat. A better option for this kind of setup is a switching power supply. For example, you can use a 5 volt, 10 amp switching supply. The reason for choosing a higher current rating is to prevent the power supply from being damaged due to current drops during electrolysis. Now I need to place the electrodes on opposite sides of the beaker, making sure they don't touch each other. You can also use other types of containers instead of a beaker as long as the container is resistant to both heat and acid. That's important because electrolysis can generate a significant amount of heat. The chloride solution inside the beaker is acting as the electrolyte, that is, the conductive medium for the electricity. Here's an important point, the concentration of the electrolyte matters. If the concentration is too high, not only will it generate excessive heat, but it can also cause some of the gold, copper, and silver in the solution to escape as vapor. I had to use two pieces of copper wire to hold the graphite rods in place, simply because I didn't have another way to keep them steady around the beaker. Earlier, 
I mentioned the importance of electrolyte concentration and the risk of element evaporation due to excessive heat. Let me explain this a bit more clearly. The elements present in the ore, once dissolved in acid and after the nitric acid is removed, become part of a chloride solution, but in ionic form. These ions need to be converted back into their metallic state, like gold, silver, or copper in powder form. But to do this, a transformation must occur, and this requires an intermediary element to help with the exchange. This is called an ion exchange, and in chemical recovery, we often use substances like SMB, sodium metabisulfate, or copper sulfate to carry out this reaction. The same concept applies to electrolysis, but it's not as simple as it might seem. Now, I'm not going to dive into complex terms or equations in this video, because I want to keep things clear and simple. Instead, I'll explain everything in a way that's easy to understand, without making it boring or overwhelming. So, excessive heating of the solution during electrolysis usually has two main causes. The first is high concentration of the solution, which you can fix by diluting it with distilled water. The second is high voltage applied during electrolysis. Electrolysis should be done in a way that the solution doesn't get noticeably warm. Electrolysis of a cyanide solution is similar to that of gold chloride, and if I get the chance, I'll make a separate video about the cyanide process as well. Also, please keep in mind, Working with chemicals must always be done in a well-ventilated area and with proper safety precautions. During electrolysis, various gases are released, and you should never inhale them. Always use safety glasses, a mask, and proper protective clothing. Friends, your health is much more valuable than finding gold. YouTube has recently added a useful new feature. You can now join the discussion right below the videos. Feel free to leave your questions there, and I'll do my best to answer all of them. It looks like something is starting to deposit on the cathode. And it also seems like the graphite rod is beginning to break down. But how is that possible? Isn't graphite supposed to be resistant to acids? Let me check the voltage. Yes, it's set to 5 volts. Interestingly, there's a fine powder forming on the graphite rod connected to the positive terminal, but it's settling at the bottom. We'll need to give it a bit more time to see what exactly is happening. As you can see, there are also some materials sticking to the negative side graphite rod, the anode. This very simple experiment might end up giving us some important insights. Two of our friends have recently supported the channel and I want to sincerely thank them here. I truly hope that future videos and research can show how grateful I am to all of you for your kindness and support. As I've mentioned before, many of the older videos don't meet the quality standards I aim for, mainly because I used to work with very limited resources. But thanks to all of you who have stayed with the channel, I'll be gradually replacing them with better quality content. Right now, we're testing and extracting the elements present in this mineral. These blue and sometimes green colors you see are the sulfates of different elements, and they are often mistaken for minerals like malachite or turquoise. This mineral is neither an oxide nor a sulfide, it's actually in the form of elemental sulfates. Please note, in this experiment, I'm not just focusing on gold precipitation. I want to observe how all three elements, gold, silver, and copper, behave during the process. And I'm especially interested to see what happens when both electrodes are made of the same material. One important topic we need to talk about is the sulfide form of elements. I've discussed this quite a bit in my previous posts, and as I've explained, almost all elements in the periodic table can form sulfides. Let's define this in a simple, practical way. A sulfide is basically the result of ionic interaction between an element and sulfur. I think that's a fairly accurate working definition. Some of you have asked, can we release gold sulfide just by burning sulfur? And the answer is, not exactly. Here's why. 
we're talking about gold sulfide, which means if you directly burn the sulfide with a flame, the gold ions themselves can also evaporate. And this is one of the most important points to understand. Since the ions don't yet have their own atomic mass fully stabilized, they can easily vaporize along with the sulfur. So the question is, how can we help these ions gain weight or stabilize? The simplest method is to use copper sulfate without nitrates. It works well both in acidic and alkaline solutions. Let me explain with a simple example. Right here in this large beaker on the table, we have a chloride solution containing gold, copper, and silver. Now, if we just add sulfur to this solution, nothing much will happen. That's because sulfur doesn't easily enter into a chemical reaction on its own. However, if we boil sulfur together with sodium hydroxide, we create a compound called sodium sulfide. Now here's the interesting part. If we add this sodium sulfide to our chloride solution, it will gradually neutralize the hydrochloric acid, and the metals in the solution will start to convert into their sulfide forms. As the water evaporates, you'll notice beautiful colored crystals forming, these are made of sulfides of elements like gold, copper, and silver. I hope I'll have time to make a dedicated video just on this process, because it's quite important and fascinating. Alright friends, we're now getting close to the final stages of the experiment, and I'd like to share a few important notes about the electrodes. If you're using iron or copper as your electrodes, there are some key things to remember. Any metal used as the anode, meaning the positive side, will gradually dissolve. This means that the metal from the anode is released into the solution as ions and is replaced by the elements already dissolved in the solution, which then plate onto the cathode as solid metal. The choice of anode metal depends on which element you want to recover. For example, iron can precipitate many metals, including gold. As for the cathode, it's best to use pure titanium sheets because titanium doesn't dissolve easily in acid and remains stable throughout the process. Let me now remove the electrodes from the solution so we can see what actually happened. As you can see, the electrode at the anode doesn't seem to have decomposed at all, even though it looked like it was breaking down in the solution earlier. A significant amount of metal in powder form has stuck to the cathode, which means it's holding metallic elements. Now it's your turn. What do you think is the substance that formed on the anode? And why do you think it deposited there instead of the cathode, where we normally expect metals to settle? Friends, if you take a look at this table, you might find the answer to the question we raised. This table shows us under what conditions certain elements may deposit at the anode, and others at the cathode. However, keep in mind that in this setup we did not use a reactive metal as the anode, both electrodes were made of graphite. If you use a metal electrode that dissolves in acid, then almost everything will deposit at the cathode. In cyanide solution electrolysis, the conditions are slightly different, and I'll cover that in a separate video. As you can see, all the elements in the solution have precipitated as metallic powder, ready for melting. If you look closely at the color of the solution, some amount of dissolved elements still remains, but I chose to skip that part to avoid making the video too long. By subscribing to the channel, you'll get access to exclusive members-only videos. Also, your likes and comments help the channel grow and improve the quality of future videos. Thank you for your support.